Welcome back, everyone. And for those of you just joining, welcome to our virtual Super Science Saturday, streaming live from our homes and labs to yours. Now we're about to head up to the NCAR Mesa Lab in Boulder, Colorado to join our science wizards for a game of hide and seek. Now, as the game is going on, if you have any questions, definitely submit them to us in one of two ways, either Slido, which I'll pop the link in the chat right now, um, or straight in the Zoom Q&A. And we'll answer them once the game wraps up. And with that, let's check in with Jared, Janine, and Zeus about this game of hide and science. So hi, everyone. Um, yeah, as, as has been talked about already today, the Mesa Lab is unfortunately still close to the public, which is why we're still doing this virtually. Um, but between the Mesa Lab being close to the public uh, and most NCAR staff still working from home these days, the Mesa Lab is actually a pretty great place to play hide and seek. So a few days ago, we all got together to play this game and we had tons of fun and uh, hope you enjoy watching uh, the video of us playing hide and seek in the Mesa Lab. It's going to be. Jeff, what are you doing up there? Oh, hi, Cecile. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so today I'm playing hide and seek with the other wizards. Oh, this is a great idea. The Mesa Lab is closed. It's a perfect place to play hide and seek. Yeah. But you should be careful because 20 years ago they were playing hide and seek in the basement and they lost one of the wizards. They haven't found her yet. Oh man, that's crazy. I, I don't heard know that. if it's true, but it's true. I've heard it too, so maybe it is true. Yeah. Did you find anybody up there? No. You know, it's pretty dark in the basement here in places, so I was trying to look with this black light, and so if anyone's wearing a white shirt or something, then that will glow under the black light or like this paper here. Oh, this is really nice. Yeah. yeah. Did you check the weight room already? Oh, I didn't. Good point. Yeah. No, maybe we should go there and yeah. tell you I have another black light. So if you want to take this one. I would love to help you. Yeah, let's yeah, go. Let's, let's go. go together. Yeah. yeah, let's off to the weight room. The weight room is here. Oh, good. Yeah. And that's not getting much use while the building's closed. So it's going to be a great hiding spot. Yes. Then. How does a black light work? Yeah, so certain chemicals absorb light and they give it out again. They give it out again. And in fact, uh, some laundry detergents have phosphorus in them. And that makes clothes kind of glow bright in sunlight. We call that phosphorescence hmm. because it comes from phosphor originally. Yeah, but it's true. Look at my socks. Oh, wow. Yeah, Isn't that's it amazing. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's working really well. Hopefully you can find some. Uh, yes, let's yes. keep looking. Maybe they have white socks. Hey, I found one. I found one. Aha. Uh -huh. You got me. Who is it? Oh, let me turn the light on. Yes, I am Zeus. You wizards are amazing. How did you find me? This is because of the black light. Oh. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there something in my hair? There must be. There must be some dye in your hair that phosphoresces. Oh. Hmm. How's about that? Well, well, look at this. And your teeth too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, congratulations. Found him. Are there any more wizards left to find? Yes, you are the first one. No. <laughs> yes, oh, you are. Okay, then let's then go I, look for some more wizards. I think I will look in the basement, and why don't you go upstairs? Yeah, we'll go to the crate. That'd be a good place oh, to hide. Good Excellent. idea. Okay, off we go. Okay, I'm doing the basement. Okay, okay, see you later. Well, here we are at the old Cray computer. I guess the black light's not going to work here because it's way too bright. So we have to find... Hmm. True story. Back in 1989, I took a tour of Cray Research in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Whoa. And they gave us and showed us proudly the new Cray YMP. Wow. This machine was loaded. It had. 256 megabytes of main memory. Wow, 256. Imagine what you could do with that. Hold on. Megabytes? Yeah, yeah. Just, my phone has 10 times more than that. Oh, that's right. Things have changed a lot, haven't they? Hmm, so, cell phone. I know. 
I'll bet one of the wizards has forgotten to turn off their ringer. Oh, yeah. So call the wizard hotline number and we'll be real quiet and listen so we can hear anything. One ringy dingy. Two ringy dingy. Ah! And car wizards, how can we help? <laughs> oh, you got me. With technology. Oh, great. Well, I'm going to go off down these hallways and keep looking for people. All you right. guys want to team up and try and find someone else? Yeah. Sounds good. Have fun. You know, that cell phone ringer trick works only once. Yeah. So, you got an idea? I have this carbon dioxide analyzer. Let, let me show it to you. Oh. Here, hold, you hold the computer. Okay. Um, we built this to bike up and down the Mesa Lab Hill, but we've now converted it to be a backpack. Oh, version. So, and um, so it suck. It's gonna suck in air if you turn on the pump on the back right. there. Right. Yeah, and then ah. the carbon dioxide concentration is gonna read out right there. And because people breathe out carbon dioxide, I think we might be able to sniff out a wizard. Oh, cool. Which way do you think we should go? Let's head toward the auditorium. All right, follow me. <laughs> we got him now. 450 parts per million, 460. Let's check in here. Okay. 650, 780, 1,000 PPM. I think we've got one. Aha, oh. a wizard. Oh man. Come I on thought, out. I thought this was a great hiding spot in there. What, what were you doing in there? Well, I wasn't sure how long I was going to be in there hiding, so I brought in these Snow crispy treats that Chef Nancy made for us, but found me too quickly, so I didn't get to have one. Uh, I'm gonna go bad. look by the lightning exhibit and see what I can find. Good I idea. Can... See you later, Zeus. Well, unfortunately, you were uh, breathing in there. Uh, next time, you have to remember to hold your breath. <laughs> okay, <laughs> guess I gotta practice that for next time. So, uh, there are some more wizards that we need to find, and they're probably just as hungry as I am, and you know, these Snow crispy treats are a great way to lure out a wizard. Ah, yes. So I think we should go upstairs and see if we can find any up there. All right, let's do it. Hmm. Oh, hey, here's the library, Britt. That might be a great place for a wizard to hide. What do you think? Oh, great idea. I I'm just going to read this thing about carbon dioxide first. Come on, Britt. We, got we have wizards to find. Oh, Come on. All right. No, Britt, this really is a great place to hide. And I can't believe what they've done with this library since I was last here. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of wizardly things That's so here. cool. I, I bet there's somebody hiding around here somewhere. Yeah, we need to find the perfect spot for this. I think there's a good spot right over here. Cool. I'll bet you there's a wizard somewhere around. So we've got to find good hiding spots, but not too far away. So, hey, Britt, how about you go over here, and I'm going to hide right in here so I can keep an eye on the Snow crispy treats. Snow crispy rice treats. My favorite. I love these. Found you! Oh, I got you! Oh man, you got me! I've been hiding here for a long time. You must have been hungry. I was really hungry. You got me. I love these. These are my favorite. Well, I think there are some other wizards that we need to go find. So, how about we go down to the mezzanine? I think there's some good spots around there. And, hey, don't you have uh, an infrared camera? Yes, I do have an infrared sensor. Maybe that will help us find these other wizards that are hiding in this building. That sounds like fun, but I got some weird CO2 readings from the roof, so I'm going to go check that out first. All okay, right, you great. guys have fun. Good idea. Okay, Good you luck. Can... All right, come on, Jeff. Let's okay. let's go. I'm taking this with me. I love it. Those other wizards are right. These Rice crispy Treats are such good brain food. You know, this really is a great place for a wizard to hide, so I'm pretty sure we'll find someone here. Yeah, hey, I've got this IR camera, and it's infrared, and with it we can see heat signatures. We might be able to track down the other wizards using this infrared camera. That's such a cool way. Let's, let's see if it let's works. Let's see what we can find. Wait, look. I see footsteps. They're, they're going to the main seminar room. 
I bet you the wizard is curious what it looks like now that it's being renovated. Let's go find out. Right. Wow, it sure is dark in here. Do you hear music? Is your camera showing anything, Jeff? Whoa, look at that. I'm picking up a heat signature right in the middle of the main seminar room. That, that looks like a person flying and twirling. What, what, how can, how can that be? Uh, yeah, she's it, so it, much it, warmer it, than the rest of the environment that the infrared camera is picking up her heat signature incredibly well. That might be... Do you think that's a wizard? They're spinning around and floating in the air. Maybe it is a wizard. I've, I've never seen a flying wizard before. I'm trying to think of who we haven't found yet. It's... Say, do you think that could be Christina? I think it's a wizard. I think we found one. Look at that. Oh, definitely. Ha, Christina, we found you. Hey, Christina. Come on down, Christina. We've got you. Man, Christina, what you did in there was so cool. Thank you. Amazing. How do you defy gravity like that? How do you make wizards fly? Yeah. Well, to stay in the air, you have to balance or counteract the force of gravity. And there are a couple ways to do that. The first is you can pull yourself up using your muscles. The second is that you can wrap the fabric around your body and when you get enough wraps, they, those wraps that create friction, then the force of the friction balances gravity and you stay in the air. That makes sense. That's so great. So I've never seen a flying wizard before, but you know, I still think there are a couple of wizards here that we haven't seen. They must have a really good hiding spot. I have an idea how we can find them. Do you do it? Yes, come in. All right, let's go. Look, there's a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud outside. It's Whoa! so cool. Well, you were the last one we found, so you're the winner. Yes. Yay! Great All right. Game. So Thank great, you, yeah, great game, everyone. So same time next week. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. All right. Well, let, let's head out and have some have yeah, some did snacks. You come, I can't believe they still haven't found me. Well, that was awesome. I think Janine's the true winner for not being found, right? Yeah. <laughs> So Janine, I, I was wondering, you know, there was that missing poster of you that we saw a few times during during the video. Is there any significance to your photo on that missing poster? That photo was taken when I was about 20 years old. I was a student assistant at NCAR. And so I have worked at NCAR a really long time and that is my staff photo. It's still hanging on the wall in HAO, which was the first group I worked with. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I should point out that that Cray one in the basement of NCAR is not the Cray YMP that I saw in Chippewa Falls. The Cray one was located there and installed in the 1970s, and it had one megabyte of memory, which was a screaming amount of memory at the time. And scientists were very happy to have that and run real powerful atmospheric models on that supercomputer. Yeah, it's crazy how quickly things have advanced in really a short period of time. It hasn't been all that long. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool, so we have about 10 minutes to dive into some questions and answers. And we have a couple coming through on the chat, uh, particularly about some of the instrumentation y'all were using to, to find the different wizards. And Nicholas is specifically wondering about the, the CO2 analyzer that Brit had and how that works. And Nicholas, I'll also say that we have a whole show on the CO2 analyzer coming up this afternoon. So maybe we can briefly, quickly answer, what is the CO2 analyzer? 
So I, th I think I could take a stab at that. Um, so yeah, that, that long tube um, that, that was on the instrument, it, it sucks in air. And then in the pack, there's, um, uh, yeah, it, it, in the pack, there's um, an infrared gas analyzer. And so it's able to use light to um, use light to, to sense what, uh, what gases are in the air that's being sucked in, how, basically how much carbon dioxide. Got it. And there's there was also a number of other instruments that y'all had used in there too. You know, the black light at the beginning, some of the infrared stuff. Could you tell us a little bit about how those instruments worked? Does anybody well, want to go first? The black light makes things phosphoresce. So that's things that are white. And like my teeth was really my teeth were really bright, my hair just a little bit. So things that have, like Jeff said, the, the phosphor in them to make them white, the bleach things. Those are the things that you're going to uh, light up. And the infrared is measuring heat. So heat emits light, I'll call it, a wave, but it's not something our eyes can pick up, but the infrared sensor can pick it up. So we're emitting that all the time, but you can see it when you look at it with an infrared sensor. And the CO2 sensor that Britt had on his back, we make bigger ones and more streamlined ones. We put them on the wings of airplanes and fly around and measure not just carbon dioxide, but all complicated chemicals like formaldehyde, monoterpenes, and all sorts of things that use carbon compounds. And we fly around places um, over forests and over wildfires and measure lots of chemicals using similar technology to what you saw on Brit's back. That makes sense. Um, and then Nicholas had one other question. Um, how does a telescope work? And I think they might have been referring to the solar telescope that was in that last shot with everybody. So a telescope has a huge lens on it. it it's a shaped kind of like a bowl and it concentrates small amounts of light that it can pick up into something that's bright enough that we can see it. Ah, that does make sense. Cool. And speaking of that room at the end, you called all the scientists with a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud. Can you, can you tell us what is a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud? So I can, t I can take that. Um, so a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud, um, if you look at it, it basically it's, it's a kind of a long, thin cloud, but then it looks like it has a bunch of waves, kind of like ocean waves on it. And uh, that's because um, like if you go to the ocean and you see the surf coming in, the waves coming into the shore, um, that is also what's called the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And explaining what exactly that instability is takes a lot of uh, math and physics, but basically um, you, you have different densities of air or, 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 or water in the case of uh, if you see it in the ocean, um, basically causing, causing these uh, wave breaking events um, and so it's really neat to see them up in the uh, up in the sky. We see them fairly frequently um, here in Colorado. Um, not super common, but uh, if you keep your eye out and you see you see a cloud that looks like it has these uh, breaking waves, like you'd see on the surf, that's a Kelvin Helmholtz cloud, and they are really cool. So it's no wonder it drew everyone out at the end. <laughs> yeah, and after, as you watch them, you can see the waves move and break over each other if you watch them up in the sky. So, Jared, in the ocean, we see waves near the shore where it's more shallow. Are we seeing them here on the Front Range because of the mountains making the atmosphere kind of more shallow because the mountains are tall? Well, I think there's definitely there are definitely uh, layers of air of um, more dense or less dense air. So I think that is part of it. But I actually have seen Kelvin Helmholtz clouds before, um, actually in the middle of North Dakota, of all places, oh, wow. uh, when we were driving back to visit family in Minnesota. I was really surprised to see them there because there isn't a whole lot of complex terrain in the middle of North Dakota. So and, they, and they happen in more places than just here. And you were late to arrive for the family reunion because it was so exciting. I definitely pulled over the car and took pictures, even though it was about 10 degrees outside. <laughs> so even, even we really do get excited about Kevin Helmholtz clouds. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally fair. Um, and in the chat, Violet has a great point about how a telescope is kind of like a spoon when you look into it and it looks 
super magnified when you're staring in there. So that, that's a great comment, Violet. Um, so as we, as we wait for some other questions to maybe come in from the audience, uh, it, it seemed like there was a lot of rooms and spaces in the Mesa lab. So just how big is the Mesa lab and what kind of stuff goes on up there? That's a good question. I couldn't tell you how many square feet. I know there are lots of towers and hallways and definitely tons of different spaces, labs, usually in the basement. And I certainly have gotten lost up here before, <laughs> especially in the, especially in the basements. The basements are, uh, they can be a bit maze-like. So an interesting thing I heard was the architect, I am Pei, thought that scientists liked to work in kind of maze-like places and he did that on purpose. So we have him to blame for it. Yes, I have heard that before. He camped up on the Mesa before the um, towers and anything else was built just to get a feel for the place and kind of wanted something that would fit in. So sort of the reddish rock that you see on the outside of the Mesa lab is supposed to look at the flat irons and the other rocks on the side of Green Mountain and Bear Mountain. So it's supposed to fit in the Mesa as a sort of a natural thing, even though, of course, this is a building where we do scientific research. And the next time that um, you are able to come up to the Mesa lab, once we finally do open up to the public again, um, in that final room uh, by the telescope where everyone popped out, uh, there actually is a pretty big exhibit there about uh, about I M Pei, the architect who designed the Mesa lab, and just kind of how it was built and everything. Uh, so I encourage you next time you are able to come up here, uh, definitely take some time and take a look at that too. We have a cloud bowl and a tornado and drop songs and a lot of other things that are really neat to see. So hopefully that will happen soon. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, so I do see a question for Christina. I don't know if Christina is in Zoom uh, quite yet, um, but maybe one of y'all can answer it about how did she spin around on the aerial silks? I, I believe she's going to type in an answer uh, in um, in the chat uh, to to be able to answer that because I mean we were just we were just amazed watching her we we don't really know how she did that it's beyond our wizardly abilities. <laughs> I see she just popped in so I'll give it a second for, uh, to unmute okay. the mic. Sure. I don't have the best background for video here. Um, but basically what you do is you wrap the fabric around your body in a way that enables you to stay in the air. And then and to get yourself to figure spinning, out how to apply force to make yourself spin when you're hanging, right? You yeah, push so when you're pull on something. When you're spinning, you generally grab the, the tail that's hanging below you and you rotate your arm and you spin in the opposite direction that you're rotating your arm. So that's how you get that's a how you... That's pretty cool. I'm I'm definitely not that coordinated, so I'm very impressed. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there was one other question that came in from uh, Nicholas. Going back to the trace gas analyzer, um, or I'm sorry, the infrared gas analyzer. I'll get that right at some point. <laughs> um, how hard was it to make that? Um, and, I, and maybe since y'all, since that was Brit's machine, you know, how hard in general maybe is it to create some of these instruments that we use? So the instruments I've been involved with have a whole teams associated with them and can take years to develop. We have um, at NCAR a machine shop that can, you know, make little parts for us out of metal. They have all kinds of 3D printing, all the stuff we need to do that. And we have people who are engineers who make the designs, they write the designs for how to do this stuff. We analyze it, we have project managers, we have software engineers like me who have to then write code to analyze that data and make the plot that you were seeing on the computer when they found Jared. So yeah, it's a whole team and it can be a multi-year process to come up with a new scientific instrument. And then when you're really happy with the machine, you have to put it in a rack and have a little tube which goes outside the airplane to a little tube that collects the air and brings it back out inside and measures things, all this happening at 25,000 feet. 
So um, also, there are some inexpensive uh, scientific instruments out there. However, they tend to be less accurate. Uh, for instance, you can get um, CO2 sensors that uh, can, for instance, sense someone breathing, or you might see them sometimes in schools or restaurants to tell you what the CO2 concentration is inside that room, kind of as a proxy for how well is the room ventilated, uh, which uh, has relevance for what is the risk for spread of airborne diseases like COVID-19, for instance, because if, the, if there's high carbon dioxide concentrations in the room, then the room isn't being ventilated very well and you might uh, be getting buildup of other nasty aerosols that could make us sick. So the expensive ones do take a lot more time and effort to put together um, um, to be a lot more accurate, but there are some less expensive, less accurate ones out there too. So you kind of do get what you pay for. <laughs> Definitely. And, and Britt actually just texted me that too, that there's some inexpensive ones, not very accurate. And then the ones on our airplanes are several hundred thousands of dollars. <laughs> um, cool. So we're nearing the, the top of the hour. I want to give a big thanks to Cecile, Jeff, Janine, Carl, Britt, Jared, Jeff, Christina, and Kate. Thank you so much for participating in our game of hide and science. Um, we do have a survey on Slido if y'all are interested in providing feedback and Tiffany will pop the link into the chat there. We're going to take a 30 minute break and we hope to see y'all back here at the bottom of the hour, 1230 Mountain Time for our next show with our friends from Beanstalk. So hope to see you then.